Hello, I'm Ranger Mara at Shenandoah National Park, and today we are going to explore a very special place in the park. This is called the Big Meadow. This area has a unique combination of both natural and cultural features. On a future episode, we will focus on those cultural features, the human story of the meadow, but today we're going to focus more on the natural story, who's living in the meadow, what we're going to find out there in the way of plants and, and animal life. This meadow has three main facets. One of those facets is the elevation. We're at about 3,500 feet here in elevation, and that's pretty high. So this area stays cooler than the surrounding lowlands, 10 degrees or more throughout the year in difference. So it can be cooler up here, and plants that like cooler temperatures throughout the year can thrive here. And as a result, we have quite a diversity of plant life in the meadow. In fact, 18% of Shenandoah National Park's rare plants can be found here. The second facet is that there is a wetland. In the very center of the meadow, the lowest spot is where groundwater will rise above the surface from winter snowmelt or seasonal rains, and that water will stay at the surface until we get through our, our drier summer air uh, times, and that water level will then go below the surface. But right now, it's pretty squishy out there. Uh, we're at the, uh, the end of June, and we've had a good amount of rain uh, so far this spring. So that wetland is also an important component in the habitat. So certain plants that need to have a, a fair amount of water throughout the year will appreciate that and will thrive here. So we've got a high elevation wetland, but it's also a very open area. And that's the third facet. Most of Shenandoah National Park is forest. About 95% of this park is trees. So this meadow is 130 acres of open space. It's the largest open area in the whole park, and that makes it quite different. Uh, it's an area that uh, normally would have forest succession happening. That is when you have an open area, and nature likes to fill in an open space with trees. So you start out with grasses and flowering plants. Eventually shrubs will come in, shade out those smaller plants, and then eventually trees will come in later and shade out the shrubs and you have a forest. That's forest succession. But it's not happening here for a couple of reasons. This meadow was used by people for a long time, for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years. Now we know that valley farmers, starting in about the mid-1800s, began to graze their livestock up here. Those people owned the land up here, would bring their cattle and sheep up here to graze in the spring, summer, and fall. And those animals helped to keep the little saplings from creating a forest. So they helped to keep this area open. When Shenandoah National Park came in in the 1930s, the park managers decided that it would be good to maintain this as an open area instead of allowing the forest to completely fill it in. So that's why we have the meadow still today. Now we have to manage it actively or that forest is going to want to fill in more. So when we go out in the meadow, we'll find out just how the park is managing the meadow. So the park actively manages the meadow to keep it open and to try to keep those trees from coming in. We're standing on a dividing line between two sections of our management operation. The side on this, um, my left side, was mowed in December of 2019, so about six months ago. The side on my right was left fallow, so you can see there's a big difference. The mowed side, much shorter. Um, plants are still coming up because they're perennials. Um, this side, you've got a thick growth of shrubs. So why do we uh, mow and why do we burn? Burning helps us to slow down the growth of woody shrubs like these. These are maleberries that you're seeing for the most part. They've got small white flowers. We can look at this one right here. And um, last year's seeds are still on there. Little brown rounded seeds with X's on the top. They look like little hot cross buns. The seeds, the seeds stay on those plants um, throughout the, the season. Uh, birds may eat them. But this is a mix of maleberry as well as some blueberries in the front 
and some deer berries mixed in as well. All members of the Heath family, we also have some huckleberries uh, growing among them. Um, so native shrubs, but they tend to get thick. And imagine if you were a flowering plant trying to get some sunlight, very difficult in a thick growth like this. So that's where the burning part of our management uh, routine comes in. When we burn, we're actually uh, slowing down the growth of these woody shrubs by the fact that when we burn, it would be mm, spring, uh, late March, early April, these shrubs will have started to put their leaves out. So when we burn, it causes those stems to then put a new growth of leaves out, and that takes time. So while those leaves are coming out, the flowers around these shrubs have more of a chance to get more sunlight. and attract pollinators and then they're ready to go to seed by the time these have leafed out again. So it's really kind of slowing down the growth of these guys. Then uh, later whenever we mow this in another year it will mow the dead stems that were still standing up that might have been burned and it just smooths over the look of the meadow. So we combine the burning with the mowing to uh, maintain our meadow as a meadow. One of the things you can see really well here in this side of the meadow is that forest succession coming in. We've got our flowering plants and our grasses in the front, and then in the middle we've got thick growth of shrubs starting to shade out those grasses and flowering plants, and in the back uh, another tier of trees. We'll take a closer look at those. These are the trees I was talking about. These are pioneer trees in an open space. This is called the black locust. It's a native tree, and they're doing what black locust trees are supposed to do. They're filling in that open area and starting to create a forest. How they do that is a number of ways. One is they've got some pretty sturdy thorns on there, and if you're a grazing animal, a cow, a sheep, a deer, you're not likely to want to eat these shrubs and so or the shrubs these saplings and so as a result they have a chance to start to grow up they've got small leaflets that allows a lot of sunlight in these are sun loving trees so a lot of trees can grow around each other with that sunlight coming in so black locust a native tree starting to make a forest just like it's supposed to so that makes our job tougher if we want to maintain an open meadow but that's our job <laughs> here in the park if we want to preserve this meadow as a meadow we need to, to find a way to deter the advance of the locust trees. When you stop in the meadow, you're never quite sure what wildlife might come and join you. And today, a little moth just joined me. It's landed on my foot. This is one of the spring moths. I'm not sure of its exact name. But some moths can be just as colorful as butterflies just as some butterflies can be pretty dull and brown. So this is a little moth. They'll have antennas that are not very, um, they don't have clubs on the end like, um, like butterflies do. So they'll have either straight antennas or very feathery ones that look like old time TV uh, antennas. This little tiny moth um, is out here looking for some nectar and it's possible that it may find some right over here, um, just about a foot away at this little uh, aggregation of bluette flowers. Bluettes are one of the many uh, diverse species of wildflowers that grow here in the meadow. These are native flowers, four petals and a pretty yellow center, and they grow in bouquets like this. This is one of the earliest flowering uh, plants here in the park, so we'll see these in the early spring, and they'll keep blooming throughout the, the summer in the park. So a very pretty little natural bouquet uh, greeting us today out here in the big meadow, along with our, with our friendly moth. Sometimes moths and butterflies may come to you when you're just standing still or walking in the meadow. It's important that you don't try to catch them 
or grab them because you may knock off some of the very important scales that they have on the outside um, of their wings there. And um, so if they come to you and they, and they crawl up onto you, that's fine. Just be very, very gentle with them and make sure that you put them exactly back where they were so they're not harmed. It's best not to try to touch wildlife here in the park. That includes our, our little insects because they're pretty delicate and sometimes we don't know our own strength and we could injure them. So if you see them and they come to you, that's fine. Just put them back very, very gently. There you go, little one. He doesn't want to leave. <laughs> put you back over here, bud. How about there? I'll go down here. <laughs> there he goes. This is a beautiful little native flower. It's called blue-eyed grass. And uh, as you know, grasses don't have a colorful large flower like this, so it's not really a grass. It's actually a very small member of the iris family, but the stem that it's on looks like a blade of grass. It's flat, has a leaf that stands up like a, a leaf uh, grass blade. So blue-eyed grass, a very beautiful uh, little native flower that's easily overlooked in a meadow like this where so many other things are taller than it is. Got a beautiful little shaggy flower here. This is called Devil's Bit. I don't know where the name comes from, but it's a beautiful flower. It's a member of the lily family. All of the leaves will come out from the base. Well, they'll have some sm smaller leaves coming up the stem, but the main leaves are going to be around the base. And the neat thing about Devil's Bit is that the male flowers and the female flowers are on different plants. This one happens to be a, a male flower. They have a more slender uh, stalk of flowers uh, with tightly compact uh, white flowers. So uh, these are very um, changeable from season to se from from year to year. Um, last spring or the spring before, we might have 70 uh, or more of these blooming in this little section of the meadow. Uh, this year we counted about eight. So they're very variable. Um, so they're perennials, but whether they decide to put up a flower uh, each year is, is up to them. Sometimes they, they've got a lot of enthusiasm, and sometimes they don't. This is a cheerful member of our floral community out here in the Big Meadow. This is the ox eye daisy. Now this is not a native plant like the other ones we've shown you today. This is a plant that came from Europe. And just because it's not native um, uh, doesn't make it um, uh, uh, unfriendly to the meadow. It's part of our diversity here of wildflowers. Um, if there is a non-native plant that tries to take over an area and crowd out native plants, then we call that a, a non-native invasive plant. But these guys, these oxide daisies, uh, are just here and there, and um, they don't uh, they don't take over anything here in the meadow. So they're part of our uh, plant that are available for pollinators like um, butterflies and bees and uh, just very attractive flowers out here in the meadow. Well, I'm standing in a crowd of beautiful white flowers. These are called fly poison. Uh, this is a, a type of plant that is native to North America, but also native to uh, the Old World as well. And they were named a long time ago. Apparently, uh, people used to use this plant to kill flies. They would chop up some part of the plant, I'm not sure if it was a root or leaf or stalk or flower, and uh, chop that up, put that in a saucer of milk, and set that on the windowsill uh, in the kitchen where the flies were coming in. The flies would land and drink the milk, and apparently would be killed by the juice from this plant, the fly poison. It's a member of the lily family, just like the devil's bit that we saw earlier, but fly poison gets to be much taller as you can see. 
Now the name of the plant uh, has something to do with its ability to, uh, to affect flies. The uh, genus name is uh, Meanthemum, but the species name is Musci toxicum. And in Latin that means fly poison. So, hence the name. We've got a beautiful little member of the rose family here. This is a native plant called Sinkfoil, and it's got five petals, and the leaflets are also in fives. Let's see if we can find one for you here to show. Um, they look a little like a strawberry flower. Strawberries are also in the rose family, uh, but the strawberry flowers would be white, and Sinkfoil, as you can see, are yellow, and the strawberry leaves have just three leaflets where the sinkfoil has five. These are bright, cheery, but very low lying plants, so you have to kind of look low for them. They're not going to be sticking up high to grab your attention. But these are going to be great for little pollinators like native bees uh, that are coming closer to the surface of the, of the ground to, uh, to find their nectar and, and pollen sources. We are in the lower part of the meadow. This is the, actually the lowest part of the meadow, and this is the wetland. You can tell we're getting into the wetland for in a number of ways. One is if you look down, you can see that the soil is, is wet, and uh, it's still retaining a lot of that, uh, that moisture from under underground. And you also see some large beds of moss. And moss needs to have an area that remains wet for a long time in the year, or it will dry out. And that's why uh, you start to see these mossy beds and these, you know, fairly wet uh, places that stay fairly wet all, all through the year. Um, in addition to the moss, we have a plant that looks like a grass, but it's a little bit different. These are, uh, the, or this is a type of a sedge, which is a, a grass-like plant, but um, it prefers moist areas like this or, or wetlands. And you can tell the difference between a sedge and a grass, and some of you may already know this, um, but if you kind of twirl the stem in your finger or just roll it, the uh, grass has a round uh, stalk and uh, sedges have a triangular shaped stem. So you can feel those edges when you roll the stem in your hand. So sedges have edges and grasses uh, don't. Grasses are round. So behind me is a uh, Virginia white-tailed deer. This is fawning time, and that's a doe. And my guess is that she's got a fawn tucked away somewhere in this shrubbery in the big meadow. So it's a, these thickets that we talked about can be helpful for some animals in certain times of their lives. So she'll hide her little fawn away in the brush. She'll go and forage and come back maybe an hour later. So if you see a fawn, you want to make sure that you don't get close to it. Just avoid it. You don't want to scare it so it will jump up and run away. And then when mom tries to find it, Junior's not there where she left it. So you want to stay a, a good distance from wildlife. For deer, we'd like you to stay 75, uh, 75 feet away. So that is two, um, two buses. So make sure that you stay, and we're about that length, that distance, so she's fairly comfortable uh, with us being right here, but we're not going to get any closer, and we'll just let her watch us. This is one of the rare plants that you'll find in Shenandoah National Park, and it's right here in the big meadow. This is called a gray birch tree. And we here in this big meadows area, uh, we are at the southernmost range of the gray birch tree. This is a northern tree. You find it uh, pretty uh, abundantly farther north because it likes the cool temperatures and, and other conditions. So here in the higher elevation of the big meadow, it found a home. Uh, here in the meadow proper, that we can see uh, there are only three of these trees, um, but there are plenty more of them as you go across Skyline Drive and then up 
through the story of the forest trail and towards the campground. So there, there are a fair number of these trees here, but in the meadow itself, uh, we only see these three. And one of the, the reasons we think is that deer that we just saw, they love to eat the twigs of the gray birch trees. Normally, gray birches will sprout from the root base down here. There should be a lot of little sprouts coming up, and then eventually the old trunks inside die away and those new sprouts will form a new trunk. But we don't see any sprouts at the base of this tree, and that's because the deer have eaten them all. So these trees don't have a chance to spread right here in the big meadow where there are a fair number of deer and um, these are pretty easy pickings uh, for them. Something else you might notice is that there are some initials carved in this tree and this is something that uh, we don't want you to do. In a national park all of our, our plants and, and our resources are protected and that's part of our job. So whenever you take a knife and you carve into a tree you're damaging that tree and making uh, an opportunity for um, uh, insects or, or uh, bacteria or fungus to get in there and harm that tree. So please do not uh, give in to the temptation to leave your mark <laughs> here in Shenandoah National Park. So we appreciate that. The same goes for our plants. Please leave everything attached and so that they'll be here, be able to reproduce and be here for, for next year and future generations um, to, to come and see the same things that you see. We're in a thicket of blackberry shrubs here, and they love the, the open areas here in the Big Meadow. And um, open, sunny places is what they, they uh, thrive in. Blackberries are well armed to keep the soft-skinned animals like people uh, from tromping through them very easily and other animals from, from eating their twigs. So they've got stiff stems, and as those stems, those canes get older, they'll have a four-sided shape to them. So it's kind of easy to tell the older canes of, of blackberries. When they're younger, they'll be a little more rounded, but they'll still have all of these thorns. So be, be cautious around them. However, they're going to form uh, berries that uh, birds and uh, bears and other animals will enjoy uh, later in the summer. And uh, people too, remember, as I said, you can pick berries here in the park, but just enough for your own personal consumption. But uh, be sure to leave uh, a lot of them for the wildlife and for the plants to, to reproduce. Even though this is a thicket and it's hard for us to walk through, blackberries are a native plant, so we can't get too mad at them. This is an interesting insect. A lot of people ask us about these little guys. This is called a spittle bug. It's an insect that's uh, uh, going, it's actually um, metamorphosing. There's a larva in there right now that's going to change into something different. This is a frog hopper. And uh, we can see if anybody's in there. Let's just, there it is. There's our little feller. Okay, come on out. And there he is. Okay. That's our little larva, and that's going to turn into a kind of a boxy brown uh, uh, little insect. They're harmless, um, and but they have extraordinary leaping ability. The adults can leap. If we were the size of these, or if they were our size, um, one of these frog hoppers could leap from one end of a football field to the other pretty strong leapers. But right now, this little larva, and I'm going to put him back because you can see how soft and moist he is, or she, and we want to make sure that it doesn't dry out. And that's what it does. It makes a nice little foamy blanket for itself by sucking the sap out of the plant. And it will extrude that sap and cover itself with it when you want to go back in <laughs> and cover itself up. So that way in the bright sun that's out here in the meadow, it'll be safe from getting too dry. There you go, little one. Make yourself some more, some more soap. Spittle bug.
I'm standing in a circle of grass that people ask us about why is this grass different from the others. There are a couple of dozen different types of grasses here in the big meadows, some native, some not, and they coexist pretty, pretty well. Uh, some coming up green uh, early in the spring, others later in the summer, and others in the fall. Uh, this comes up all at once. It's a native grass, and it's called blue joint grass. It grows from a central point and grows out, and that's why you see these circles. People will ask us, what are those crop circles out there in the big meadow? And I guess you could say that's what they are, but they're natural ones that are just the result of the grasses growing out from a, a central point. So there are several of these circles of blue joint grass out here in the meadow. Thanks for joining me today on our virtual meadow walk. I hope you'll come along on a future episode. Until then, this is Ranger Mara in the Big Meadow at Shenandoah National Park.